So as a brief background, in 1987, Lovas and colleagues published a landmark study showing the effectiveness of early intervention. And they looked at the short and long-term outcomes. And what they found was that children gained and acquired many skills across a number of domains, but their intellectual functioning, half of them came within um, typical range. And so these, these results are clearly impressive. Um, in 2009, ECSIF did a broader search of some of the common educational programs for children with autism and um, also found that early intervention was considered to be well established and an evidence-based practice. So although there are different styles of early intervention that are based on applied behavior analysis, there are some common characteristics within these programs. First is that the curriculum is hierarchically structured, meaning that you're going to start off with skills um, that are more basic, and you're going to increase the complexity of the skills as they acquire, as they acquire skills. Um, and typically, this hierarchy is determined by some um, developmentally, uh, the, the kinds of skills that a typical child would acquire over their, um, over their development. Um, another hallmark of early intervention is that you're simultaneously targeting multiple areas of functioning for um, a number of years. So here are some of the areas that um, you might be um, setting goals for in early intervention. Some of them are beginning skills like imitation and matching skills. Um, others are more complex like school readiness, academic skills. The area that I want to focus on today is this whole piece of, of functional language. And there are certainly um, that is, functional language is certainly a broad category, and today I'm specifically going to be talking about receptive language. So what that means is that it's the ability for a learner to respond to the language of another person. And this general category of skill is taught um, often in early intervention. In fact, it comprises a good bulk of um, intervention, particularly for young learners. And the reason why it is uh, so common is um, because uh, receptive language is a good part of um, our functional language skills, but also is very useful for teaching things like following basic instructions, teaching children how to identify items in their environment, teaching them how to identify different functions of items and, and so forth. In general, there are two kinds of um, receptive language skills, and, I'm, and I'm, these are kind of in their most broad category. So the first relies on something called a simple discrimination. So what that involves is that the teacher would present some kind of, it usually comes in, in the form of a vocal instruction, although um, they might be um, visual as well. So the teacher might say something like, clap your hands. The child makes some kind of specific motor behavior, and usually the instruction is indicating the behavior that's desired on the part of the learner. And then some kind of reinforcer is delivered. So those are the kind of the ABCs, the antecedents, behaviors, and consequences that are related to that kind of skill. And so when you talk about receptive language skills that involve simple discriminations, you're talking about skills like teaching a child to respond to their name, teaching a child to look when you ask them to, um, teaching a child to follow simple instructions like um, go get that piece of paper for me, um, please sit down. Those are all receptive language skills that rely on something called a simple discrimination. So the other kind of receptive language skill relies on something called a conditional discrimination. And this kind of skill is a little bit more complex. So it encompasses the same kinds of ABCs that I mentioned before, except for in the antecedent portion, there's a vocal instruction in addition to the presentation of usually an array of stimuli. And so these kinds of programs involve teaching a learner how to identify objects after hearing their name or identifying objects based on um, a function that you provide. Um, so just to kind of give you an example, this would be a program that relies on a conditional discrimination. Um, here you're teaching the learner how to identify colors from an array of different items. So these might be color cards or they might be specific items that have different colors. Um, in addition to the presentation of that visual array, you're also presenting some kind of auditory instruction. Um, then there's a response. So the response is a little bit different. It usually involves pointing or um, some kind of touching. And then there's a consequence, and that usually involves praise and some kind of uh, preferred item. So within the category of receptive language, there are two clear types of skills, ones that rely on simple discriminations and ones that rely on conditional discriminations. 
So now that I've kind of given you a little bit of background on that kind of skill, I want to talk to you about some recommendations that a colleague and I have developed based on some of the research that I've conducted over the last couple of years, but also research in, in other areas that kind of speak to some of these things. The first thing that is very important when you're um, working on receptive language skills, and, and some of these are common across even, they're even broader, so you might apply some of these rules not only to ex receptive language but other kinds of skills. But it's really important to make sure that a child's attending before you deliver any kind of um, teaching moment. Um, and it's really important to um, use techniques to foster attending because you want the child to be paying attention to the relevant features of the teaching context. So the vocal instruction, clap your hands, is supposed to occasion clapping hands. So it's really important and critical to teach the child to pay attention to those different instructions that you're providing. So there's a couple of ways that you might go about doing that within the context of these programs. Um, one of the easiest things to do is teach a child to, or, or require the child to look at you before you issue an instruction. Um, one strategy that you might use if um, a child has difficulty paying attention to auditory instructions, if those are the kinds of instructions you're using, is you might actually have them repeat the instruction. So um, one thing that I've done in the past is something like point to car. What are you going to point to? And then I would prompt the child to say car. So that was increasing the likelihood that they were paying attention to the piece of instruction that was most important. Um, another thing that often happens in clinical practice that should be avoided is reinforcing responses before the auditory instruction is completed. So what that might look like is that you present the visual array in front of the child and you say point to and then they respond. And then there's a chance that it might be right, but it's right for the wrong reasons. It, it didn't occur because of the relevant instruction. It happened for some other reason. And so that's why responses like that should not be reinforced. So you only want to reinforce responses if they occur after you've presented the relevant information in the beginning. Um, another thing that you want to do is um, with receptive language programs that rely on a visual presentation of stimuli is that you want to make sure that they look at all of the stimuli before you deliver the instruction. And this is so that the child is actually paying attention to the things that are in front of them. So when you teach targets simultaneously, what that means is that when you decide to work on a specific skill like following simple instructions, you're gonna generate at least three different kinds of instructions that you'll be working on at the same time. So you might do clap hands, stomp feet, touch tummy, but you're gonna semi-randomly rotate those instructions within one single teaching context. This is an example of uh, teaching simultaneously. So you might be teaching color identification. So you'll identify three different kind colors that you'll be teaching. And in trial one, you target orange. In trial two, you target red. And in trial three, you target blue. So you're rotating between the different um, instructions. The most common methods are the methods described by Lovas in 2003, which I'm going to outline for you in just a minute. Um, there's another sequential method called the block trial procedure. This was developed in basic research, but they've also um, extended this to clinical populations, children with developmental disabilities. The simultaneous method, which I've kind of already described, was um, outlined by Gina Green in 2001. There are a number of procedures that are used, and when you look at the early intervention manuals that are commercially available and commonly used, overwhelmingly you'll see support for the sequential method. In clinical practice, when you ask people what kinds of procedures are you using to teach these kinds of skills, you get a bit of a mixed bag. So about a third of people say they use a simultaneous presentation, about a third say they use a sequential method, and another third say that they use both and it depends on the learner. In applied research when you compare a sequential method and a simultaneous method what you find is that the simultaneous method seems to be more efficient. So let me show you what a sequential method looks like and then I'm going to explain to you why I'm, I'm recommending in addition to some of the evidence why you might do the simultaneous method. So if you wanted to teach a child to uh, receptively identify different kinds of colors and you're using a sequential method, what that means is that you wouldn't introduce all of the targets at the same time. You would stagger the introduction of those targets and you would increase the complexity until they arrived at the final performance. So 
if you were teaching the same kind of skill I've shown you before, step one would involve just mass trialing the color blue. And the color blue would be the only thing present. Um, I'm sorry, I can move this for you. The blue stimulus would be the only thing that's present in the array. And in step two, it's the same thing except you're going to introduce the next color. Now, there is a potential issue with this kind of arrangement, which is that the child, because the auditory instruction remains the same, what the child could learn is, I just point to the thing in front of me, and then a reinforcer is delivered. So they may not be attending to the auditory instruction, and they might not necessarily have to attend to the, the visual card in front of them. And so these steps are vulnerable to establishing faulty kinds of ways of responding. Step three, you're making the task a little bit more difficult. So here you're targeting in a mass trial format still blue, but now you've made it a little bit more complex because you've introduced the red card with the blue card. So now they actually have to pay attention to the stuff that's in front of them, but because the auditory instruction remains the same, it, again, it, there's this vulnerability that a child might not actually be paying attention to that. They might just simply learn, it's the blue one, it's the blue one, it's the blue one, it's the blue one, and then that kind of response pattern um, persists. And it looks like the child has mastered the skill, but it might be mastery for the wrong reasons. Step four is the same, except for you're going to now mass trial the red stimulus. Step six, or I'm sorry, step five now is actually where they need to pay attention to the instruction. They need to pay attention to the visual stimuli because the teacher is rotating between the different instructions and there's also at least two items that are in the array. So this increases the likelihood that they're required to pay attention in order to master a skill like this. So you get to the third and final stimulus. You, you teach it in a mass trial format. Step seven is similar to step five. You're, you're targeting um, orange and blue at the same time. Step eight is orange and red at the same time. And then finally, you get to the final performance, which is you're teaching all of them and you're presenting all of them in the array. Now, what you'll notice is that step nine is identical to the simultaneous method. The big difference is that you go through these initial eight steps to get to this final performance. And there's, there's a rationale behind using something like that. Now, when a child's only presented with one stimulus and one instruction, what do you think the rate of reinforcement is? 100%. Yeah, they're, they're, they're responding accurately. And so one of the things that you really want to promote in early intervention is accurate responding with um, um, where they're acquiring skills readily. And so this kind of procedure might be appealing because of that. However, what I would remind you of is that those High level, that high level of accuracy might be occurring for the wrong reasons. It might not actually be happening because the child has actually acquired skills. So I'm going to give you some basis for why I think that people should be using the simultaneous method. First is that there are two studies that have shown that the simultaneous method is a more efficient procedure than the sequential type of presentation. So here are some overall results from my dissertation. Um, <clears throat> what I did was I taught receptive identification to three children with autism spectrum disorders, and they were between the ages of four and seven. And what I did was I generated one set of tasks that was going to be taught with a sequential method. Here I'm calling it the simple conditional method. And then I developed another set of tasks that were deemed kind of equivalent and I taught that using the simultaneous method. Here it's displayed as the conditional only method. And what I did was I basically initiated treatment at the same time. And what I was looking for is how many sessions does it take to teach this kind of skill in this format? Which one seems to be more efficient and are they both effective? And so <clears throat> the participants are displayed along the x-axis. I was lucky enough to do multiple comparative evaluations with um, each of the, the children. So that's why you see three sets for Aaron and three sets for Shane and then two for Devin. So the black bars indicate the simultaneous method. It's indicated by the um, conditional only method here. And then the open um, bars are the sequential method or simple conditional method. And so what you see is that for the most part, the 
um, simultaneous method is much more efficient. And these asterisks here on the graph indicate when we had to implement additional procedures to, um, to foster acquisition with these children. So meaning that the sequential method by itself wasn't effective. We had to change up what we were doing in order to get acquisition. So that did happen once with the uh, simultaneous method here in Shane's second evaluation. Um, and then this triangle here in Shane's third evaluation indicates that even after changing the treatment three different times to um, based on his responding, trying to remediate those error patterns that were established, we still were not able to achieve mastery. Um, in the first study, we used a prompting procedure called least to most prompting. And with that kind of procedure, um, it isn't ideal because it gives a learner a lot of opportunity to engage in, in errors. And so I hypothesize that maybe one of the reasons why we saw such a big difference between the procedures is because there was a lot of opportunity for that child to engage in errors and those things might have been facilitated and fostered over time. So what we did was replicated the study and it compared the simultaneous versus sequential method. But what we did is we used more of an errorless learning procedure. And what that means is that we provide um, more help in the beginning to get the correct behavior occur. And then we slowly back off of the assistance and help until they've acquired the responses. And the whole goal is to kind of minimize errors so that those things don't um, perpetuate. Now that I've showed you some evidence for the simultaneous method being a more efficient procedure, I'm going to give you some other reasons why um, I think that it's important to use a simultaneous procedure. The second one is that there are, as I've mentioned, a lot of steps in the sequential method that don't facilitate skill acquisition. So for example, when you place one item in front of a learner and you can constantly repeat the same instruction, there's research that shows that doing that doesn't facilitate the final performance, that the thing where you're teaching them in a simultaneous fashion. Um, so because those steps um, don't facilitate skill acquisition, then um, those, those kinds of steps shouldn't be included in the teaching procedure. Another thing that previous research has shown is that an instructional history with the sequential method actually might promote errors and something that's called faulty stimulus control, meaning that the response looks correct, but it's happening for the wrong reasons. So the first one, it's, it's got a big fancy name. It's called molar wind stay responses. But basically what this is, is that when you mass trial one stimulus in a particular step, and that's available as a, res a response option in the next step, like in step five, they're gonna continue to respond to that stimulus because you've mass trialed it in the previous stimulus. So in step four, the, uh, the teacher was targeting red. They moved to step five where they switched to targeting blue, but you still see a high proportion of responses to the red stimulus. This is the kind of error pattern that you see as a result of sequentially introducing the stimuli. So they start off step five by engaging in errors that you end up having to fix. And that's where it becomes a problem when you're introducing teaching procedures where you have to fix it, fix the, the thing that you're really trying to avoid in the first place. Um, another kind of Wednesday response is I like to refer to it as molecular because it happens on a smaller level. Instead of across steps, it's happening within a teaching moment. So on trial one, you target orange, they point to orange, they get access to a reinforcer. On the next trial, you have them point to red. That history of getting access to reinforcement for orange might influence their selection of orange in the following trial. So what you see is this kind of repeating where um, they point to orange um, here because of what happened in trial one. They're pointing to red because of what happened in um, trial two. So what happens is when they point to orange in trial two, a prompt is going to follow to point to red. And that history is probably going to um, foster responding to red in the third trial. So when I examine the data, a lot of times what you would see is this relationship between what happened in, for example, trial one and the kind of response that you're getting in trial two. And that's also a problem. Um, one thing I will mention also is that in the steps in the sequential method, a lot of times there's only two stimuli that are in front of the learner. So if they engage in responses like this, they're going to be right at least half the time 
because there's only two stimuli in front. So half the time that strategy is going to work. And because you can't detect the difference, you're probably going to be reinforcing response patterns that you're going to end up having to correct later on once you've seen the artifacts of those errors. The other thing that you often see with a sequential method is a side bias. So what this looks like is that they're responding to a particular position. Um, so you might have a top to bottom where it's you know top, middle, bottom. They might respond to the bottom one almost all of the time, or they might respond to the one that's on the right-hand side all of the time. Um, again, one reason why this might be particularly problematic with a sequential method is because, again, you only have two stimuli in the array. Now, the correct response is going to be on the right side 50% of the time. And that's not a bad reinforcement rate half the time. Even I mean, third. I don't even gain access to reinforcement half the time for my behaviors. I, even that'd even be great. That's correct. So one of the things that um, is often recommended is that you increase the array size. Because you're, if, if, they, if the array size is four, then the probability of it being right on the right side is 25%. Um, but again, this might be counterintuitive because if you're, if you're targeting four at the same time, what you're saying is that you're targeting a more complex skill. But the likelihood of them getting it right for the wrong reasons is greatly minimized by doing that, and that's the recommendation. That's why it's the recommendation. So I hope I've provided a convincing argument of why you would use a simultaneous method. Again, I think that it's somewhat counterintuitive, and that's why you see um, a good bit of the sequential method um, used in clinical settings. Because even though it took longer, it still worked. And so it's common that teachers and clinicians aren't running comparative evaluations of teaching procedures. They're just using the thing that they've always used. So if it's working, but it's working slowly, then that might be attributed to characteristics of the learner. Like he has a really difficult time acquiring receptive language skills. He doesn't seem to be paying attention to auditory stimuli when it actually might be that slow progress, progress as an artifact of the teaching procedure and not characteristics of the, the capacity of an individual to learn new skills. In fact, I would argue that if there's slow progress, that it's necessarily the teaching procedure and not characteristics of the learner. OK, so the next thing is presenting clear and concise instructions. Um, it's very important for the, um, the, the instructions that you provide to only contain the absolute relevant information. You want to kick out all of the superfluous information that isn't really helpful for the learner to behave. And the reason why is because you're trying to establish a relationship between the thing you say and what they do. And um, in, in order to be more effective at that, um, you need to isolate it to the most important components of the auditory instruction. So sometimes you'll see things like um, when a person is trying to teach eye contact, um, hey, Samantha, come take a look at me. Um, that really, the active thing there is either look or look at me probably look at me. And um, it's, it's important to only include that um, so that those other things um, don't kind of muddy up the water. So I kind of gave you some examples of um, things that I've seen that you might kind of avoid, at least initially, and some other ones that are more ideal. One thing that I might recommend or is really that the kind of instruction that you're going to be delivering should be guided by the kind of program that you're running. So it might be completely reasonable to use things like point two, but it would be most reasonable in the context of teaching kids how to have different selection responses. Point two, cover up, hand me, show me. But if that's not the purpose of the, the uh, program, then the name of the item the name of the function should be the, the, the main bulk of the instruction. This particular recommendation is exclusively for those times when you're teaching conditional discriminations. This is where you're usually presenting some kind of array to the learner. Um, one of the things that uh, is really important is to rotate proportionally and semi-randomly the positions of the, all of the different stimuli across the different positions. I'm going to show you what this looks like, but um, so what that means is that if you're targeting yellow, red, and blue, red, yellow, and blue need to be located in the left, middle, and right positions in an even format. 
So what you wouldn't want to do is have the red stimulus on the left-hand side most of the time, and then like the blue stimulus on the right-hand side most of the time. That would not be beneficial for the learner, and I'll talk to you a little bit about why that might be the case. Um, also, the position of the correct answer should be rotated between the different positions proportionally. So what you wouldn't want to do is target red, and the red one is right always on the left-hand side because you might promote a side bias. Um, one of the things that you often don't see in educational settings is people keeping track of this. Usually it's kind of left to the person that's running the program to just kind of mix it up. But without planning, it is very unlikely that a person will counterbalance appropriately. And I'll um, show you an example of a data sheet this is an example of a dissertation data sheet that I used, and um, it shows the trials, and we were looking at receptive idea of food categories. So we'd place different items that were either meats, fruits, or vegetables, and we would say something like meat, and then they would point to the chicken. Um, and so you can see that um, fruit, vegetable, and meat are all correct on the left-hand side. The bolded ones are the correct ones. In the middle position, vegetable, meat, and fruit are right, and then in the, in the right-hand side, meat, fruit, and vegetable are correct. And if you actually spent the time looking at it, what you'd find is that regardless of whether it's right or not, vegetable is on the left-hand side 33% of the time, in the middle position 33% of the time, and in the right-hand side 33% of the time. Not only did I come up with this, but you can't just use one of these because if you issue the trials exactly like that over and over again, what do you think might the child learn? The order, right? So the first one, it's always on the right-hand side. The second one, it's always on the left-hand side. So that's why not only you have to come up with counterbalancing once, but for, for my studies, I do it at least three different versions of that. So sometimes it's right in the left-hand side, sometimes it's right in the middle and then I rotate between these different versions. So you can see how complicated it took me a long time to be able to figure out these permutations, and that's why I'm saying it's really unreasonable to expect a therapist to arrange these stimuli and counterbalance appropriately and make sure that these stimuli are correct, you know, a certain proportion of trials. It's just an enormous task, and then you're talking about over the course of 30 trials, you just simply you know, our, our memory is just is not that, that big. And so um, that's why what I advocate is actually developing a data sheet where these things are done ahead of time. So this was, um, for, for the therapist to use, it told them um, how you present the stimuli in terms of the left, middle, and right. So in trial one, the left hand is vegetable, fruit, and then meat, and meat is correct. So it gives the therapist everything that they need to do, how to arrange it, and, and so then it's, it's, you're making it less uh, likely that those responses will, um, you're making sure that you aren't inadvertently training up inappropriate kinds of responses. So for example, if meat happened to be right two out of the three times in the right position, you might actually develop a right side bias with meat. And what they might not learn is meat, it's right. You know, so there is this potential for teaching it incorrectly. And if you're not keeping track of this, then it's likely that you're probably doing something that's like that. Um, the other recommendation is um, reducing or eliminating teacher cues. Um, and this can happen without planning and inadvertently and people just kind of don't pick up on it when they're doing it. So examples of that is when you place out the array, a therapist tends to look at the correct response more often kind of because they're responsible for delivering reinforcers. And the way they can most efficiently do that is to look at the stimulus and as soon as the kid touches it, they, respond, they provide the reinforcer. And so it's not like it's intentional, but that might happen as a result of the kind of responsibility that they have when they're running these trials. And I have seen children basically in these sessions where they just simply reference what the teacher is looking at and then they respond. And from the teacher's perspective, it looks like everything's great when really the child is simply referencing what the, the therapist or the teacher is looking at. Um, another thing that often happens with arrays is that you might get them, uh, teachers might be more likely to put the correct one down first 
and then kind of search for the distractors and put those out or the opposite where they put all the distractors out and then they thumb through the correct stimuli and then they put the, the right one. So unfortunately what the child's gonna learn is the first one you put up, ding, 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 that's the one I'm gonna hit or, you know, or the, the opposite. And so um, it's important to arrange the array outside of the child's view and then to present them all together. So you wouldn't want to just start rotating them in front of the child and they kind of learn the rotation procedure as well. Um, another thing is body mannerism. So you might say clap your hands and there's just, just the bit, littlest bit of um, body mannerism. That kind of thing can come to occasion um, seemingly correct behaviors. Although when you have other people do them that aren't emitting those body mannerisms, all of a sudden the child can't complete the skill. And that's kind of one of the things that you can, um, that gives you an idea that that's happening. So um, what I have found at least in clinical practice, I'd be curious to see if any of you have noticed this too, is that when you have something like this, when you stack up, you know, the ch will the child learn the task or will they learn that they need to look at the therapist's eyes and where they're oriented to learn the correct one? And almost always, it's that they learn the thing that you don't want them to learn. They don't learn the task. Um, the last couple are, are pretty straightforward. Um, when you're teaching these kinds of skills, it's really important to use an effective prompting procedure. And what that means is that you're using prompts that occasion responses almost 100% of the time. So um, a prompt is something that you end up removing from the, the teaching context. It's something that you use to get responses to occur in the beginning, and then you slowly back those off until the child is responding independently. And so there's um, a lot of methods that are referred to as errorless learning procedures. There's a, a bunch of different um, procedures within that umbrella term. And I think that it's uh, important to distinguish that it's not that errors don't occur during an errorless learning procedure, it's just that you're attempting to make it less likely. So there still is a potential that the child can engage in, in errors, but they have also shown in um, previous research that you can certainly teach skills without um, errors using these errorless learning techniques, which is why that name came about. So the two um, big ones that I'm familiar with are time delay, this can occur constant or progressive time delay, and graduated guidance. I'm gonna show you what time delay looks like in a minute just to, to give you a sampling of what that looks like. But the whole point of it is to reduce errors. If you're reducing errors and you're reducing all of the, um, the, the teaching that you have to do to get rid of the errors, and um, you, th that means that you'll have more time to deliver instruction and meaningful opportunities to learn. Um, using errorless learning procedures increases the likelihood of earning reinforcement in the beginning of teaching, which if a child has problem behavior related to that, it's often a good uh, way to remove or reduce problem behavior. So let me show you what progressive time delay looks like briefly. At the top is the instruction, and then the prompt is kind of the thing that you use to occasion behavior initially, but the thing that you um, try to remove. So with a time delay, you might do something like, um, this is a different kind of skill, but what is it? Cup. This isn't a cup, but you know, you, you hold up something, what is it? Bottle. So the, the amount of time between the instruction and the prompt, there's no time. You're just basically saying them back to back. Um, there are some potential issues with that, but that's kind of what it looks like. Um, usually this results in um, very accurate responding in the beginning, as long as the child can, can imitate. And um, next what you do is you use the instruction, but you wait a little bit. And um, usually with a progressive time delay, you're gonna start out with a very small amount of time. It's usually one or two seconds. And so there's an instruction, what is it? You're gonna wait for a second. If the child responds correctly, everything's good. You deliver a reinforcer. If it's incorrect, then you deliver the prompt and then the reinforcer. So then you just slowly increase the amount of time until the learner is responding with 100% accuracy. Now, you may not even need to move past the one second time delay because if the child is responding independently at the before one second into the instruction, then that's functionally no different than a five second time delay. Does that make sense? Um, the last one is using effective reinforcers and this probably doesn't, um, this probably isn't a surprise for, for all of you. Um, 
typically what happens is that you do some kind of comprehensive preference assessment. You're usually asking the question of, of these 16 items, what are the child's favorite items? What are the things that they don't seem to be motivated by? To kind of get an idea of their preference. Um, there are some formal methods that are more comprehensive that I've listed for you. The pair choice is probably the most comprehensive and lengthy, um, but in clinical practice, a lot of people use a brief MSWO. So what that looks like is you might have four or five items. You place them in front of the learner and you ask them to pick one. And then you take data on the order that they pick them in. So they're kind of rank ordering the items for you. There's also tons of ways that you can offer um, opportunities for chi uh, to get to get access to information about a child's preference. If they have um, uh, a good communication system, you could simply ask them what are some things that they like to work for. You could also do it informally by presenting them with different choices. So that might look like um, you start a trial, you say, what would you like to work for? They pick the thing and then you do the trial and then deliver that as a reinforcer. Another way to arrange it is you run the trial and then when they engage in the correct response, you then give them a choice of uh, reinforcers. So there's lots of ways to identify um, preference and it's really important to do that because you want to make sure that you're using items that are more likely to function as a reinforcer. Um, and it's also important to assess preference at least on a daily basis. Now that wouldn't happen necessarily with a more comprehensive preference assessment, but a brief MSWO takes less than two minutes, but it yields a lot of good information. So typically, um, when I've done supervision in clinics, it's that they do brief MSWOs multiple times within that teaching session. They're also offering up choices among stimuli. So you wanna make sure that you're using potent reinforcers that are effective at that moment. If you don't assess preference often, here's what might happen. You do a comprehensive preference assessment with 16 items. You find four things that they really like. You're working, you're working, you're working, and they've had those four items over and over and over again. They're doing 40 hours of intervention. We don't like the same four items for that long. I can't imagine that a, a child would like the same four items. In fact, you'll notice this when um, kids come in contact with new toys. And so like, you know, at home they play with this toy that they love and then they go to some friend's house and they have that same toy but it's like, you know, nobody wants that toy anymore. I want all the good stuff that's new. So um, it's important to assess new items. Um, after you've done a number of preference assessments, you can usually get an idea of the kinds of things that kids like. So they seem to really like um, uh, different kinds of motion activated kinds of toys or light up toys or something like that and then you can start integrating some of those um, new items. Just briefly I wanted to talk about some general directions that I think future research might go in. A lot of the studies that I've mentioned including my own work we're really only teaching one exemplar so when we teach red it's just a, a color card with a picture of red but that is not sufficient to teach a concept and that's not usually how things are, are taught. Usually you're gonna have multiple kinds of red items like a red teddy bear, a red color card, um, a red pencil, so that you can actually teach the concept. So um, I think that incorporating multiple exemplars during this training would be really interesting to look at because I think that because the stimuli are, are ever changing and it's not the same one two or three stimuli over and over and over again because you're incorporating new stimuli, it might be the case that the sequential method is not as detrimental. Because the, the stimuli are changing, they're gonna be more likely to attend. So this is something that I'd like to see future research addressed. Um, also, incorporating multiple exemplars is a common clinical practice because people know that teaching one exemplar of blue will certainly not develop the concept of blue. So I think that incorporating multiple exemplars is important to evaluate in the sequential method, but it's also important to include because this more closely mimics what people do in educational settings. In the data, you can see that sometimes additional interventions were required even for the simultaneous method. And stalled progress is very common with these kind of skills. In fact, there are tons of studies um, trying to develop interventions to remediate a lot of the errors that I've talked to you about today. And so I think that that's another area of research where if the errors are there, how do we get rid of them? Because one of the things that's really problematic is I've never seen a successful treatment of a side bias. 
And there aren't any studies showing successful treatment of a side bias. We're, we are not there yet. Um, there's a lot of things that you might be able to do, but um, the, the closest I've gotten is to switch the location of the bias. And that's not, that's not impressive. So I think that we need more research on how to, how to get rid of these errors because one of the things that you see is once you've established them, it's really, really hard to get rid of them. And we need to avoid them from the get-go, but if they're there, we need to kind of figure out what to do with those kids. That's it.